Thank you, Clem. Those are such kind words. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure uh, to be here. And um, <clears throat> I want to thank, in particular, uh, Ken Scher, uh, Dennis McCarthy, uh, for the kind invitation. Because as you've heard from the administrative leadership at the university, there are very few areas of scientific study that could have more importance to our society than really understanding addiction. Now, I'm a, a developmentally focused clinical psychologist, worked in both clinical settings and on the basic science side. And it's really clear to me that uh, the kind of foundation that's being developed here and what we heard about MoCare uh, is going to be the bridge between basic science of, of addiction and actual clinical practice. Not just clinical practice after problems have developed, but by understanding the etiological processes and the kinds of things that are malleable uh, with regard to addiction, we can prevent, we can intervene in new and creative ways, and I think uh, there is a remarkable team here that uh, can help with that. Thank you. Uh, so, with that, get my picture off the, uh, the screen. Um, uh, I uh, want to uh, thank uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the provost, uh, the vice chancellor uh, for, vice president for research, or I guess it's vice chancellor here, and the chair for the uh, department as well, uh, for those important comments about the value of this area. I, I work at this place. This is UC San Diego, University of California, San Diego. That's a picture of our iconic library. And I always thought that this was the right place for me, not necessarily because Dr. Seuss is sitting there with a the cat in the hat behind us, uh, standing behind him, but because of this developmental focus in understanding um, human behavior over time and uh, through maturity. And there is a, a whimsical a snake leading up to the library. And for about the past 20 years, this library is considered one of uh, either the first or the second most interesting archi architecture, architectural libraries in the world. And so I always feel it's uh, my good fortune to be at UC San Diego with a focus on development and appreciation for children and bringing knowledge to the world. Um, I'd like to begin just by uh, acknowledging the, the important contributions to the research I'm going to be uh, reporting here, mine and others, uh, that come from these primarily federal agencies and indicate that I have no conflict of interest in the material that I'm going to be presenting to you today. Now, um, uh, I have known Dr. Scheer for uh, quite a long period of time. In fact, I think uh, we were near our infancy, or I guess perhaps we were toddlers at the time uh, in our scientific careers when uh, we began in, in this area. And I have grown to have a great appreciation for the quality of science uh, that comes from the University of Missouri uh, in the addiction area in particular, but in general and very importantly, the methodological rigor. Because if you're gonna build a science, you have to be sure that you understand the detailed foundations that are necessary so that we can have confidence, we can uh, have replicability in the findings that come from the work that's done. And uh, as Dr. Scher mentioned, I've mentored a few, uh, and uh, I feel I've had the good fortune also <laughs> Uh, to uh, at a slightly later stage, maybe in our adolescence of uh, science, uh, uh, developed uh, a good relationship with Dennis McCarthy. And I think this uh, motorcycle scene was taken from when he was doing a postdoc with me out in California uh, and reflects his um, uh, generous spirit. Now, with that said, I'm going to talk today a little bit about adolescent development and addiction provide a brief uh, historical perspective, some discussion about what are the characteristic changes that unfold 
uh, during adolescence and uh, what is the normal uh, brain development during that period of time and how alcohol and drugs may impact uh, that and how brain development influences alcohol and drug perspective or engagement. And then finally, where uh, addiction science is going from here. Um, I'll save some time for questions at the end uh, and uh, hope that you, in fact, have many because I know this will be a relatively brief um, overview. So uh, adolescence as a distinctive developmental period is really new in our history. Uh, and in the pre-industrial era, era, there really was no such thing as adolescence. You were a child, and then there was uh, some type of formal transition uh, that you moved directly into adult responsibilities. The work that you did, developing a family, that type of thing. Uh, and uh, so before uh, the industrial era, we didn't really talk about adolescence, and we didn't think about adolescence, either from a developmental perspective, certainly from a brain developmental perspective. But with the emergence of uh, the industrialization of the late 19th century, um, we lost some of those adult initiation rights. Uh, there was an uh, attention to the importance of extension in schooling, and there became a blend between child responsibilities or child behaviors and adult uh, responsibilities. And I think today that we have an extension even of this. In the social media era uh, and this digital uh, technology era, we were just talking about tweeting before this, you know, uh, uh, that uh, across industrialized uh, countries we now see an extension of adolescence uh, into what we consider emerging adulthood. Uh, the, it, Arnett, who pioneered that, that notion of emerging adulthood, really helps us think now about this transition, later adolescent transition phase, um, uh, after which we would expect full adult responsibilities and roles to extend at least out to age 25. The interesting thing for me is that that period demarcates a remarkable reduction in, a, in an array of behaviors that we think about as adolescent-specific behaviors, and also brain maturation. So uh, what really is adolescence? It is the one period in life that's demarcated by a biological onset, that is puberty, but a behavioral offset. And so you can see why I'm saying that it is the full adoption of adult responsibilities that help us know when adolescence is at an end. And if we look across species, what we see is a remarkable increase uh, post-puberty of uh, risk-taking behaviors, exploratory behaviors, increased social drives, affiliative needs, and advances in uh, cognitive maturity. And in humans, at least, we also see uh, more salience in affect and greater lability. So we see this all across species, and it has, a, it has a real functional component to it. If we didn't have those exploratory behaviors, my children would still be living at home, and they wouldn't be having partners living on their own independently. So these, these have very functional um, uh, components to them. So it's interesting to me that part of uh, the uh, risk-taking and exploratory behavior um, is mani it manifests in a variety of different ways, uh, one of which is substance engagement. And we know that alcohol is the preferred uh, drug for youth. And I'll be honest with you, that's been a focus of mine in particular because it's legal. And twice as many uh, youth use alcohol as any other substance. But if we look at... Um, uh, the patterns of onset of substance engagement, for example, you'll see that when you look at ages 12 to 13, it's a very small proportion that have used uh, uh, substances in the past month. But by the time they're 18 or 20, and then this 21 to 25, you see that those are the highest periods of uh, uh, prevalence for substance engagement. Now, 
youth don't use substances, in particular alcohol, in the same way that people post-25 do. In fact, if we look at alcohol, we'll see that um, youth use, on average, those, those who are uh, drinkers, uh, they use, on average, uh, four or five times per month, uh, compared to eight to nine times per month for adults, once or, once or twice a week for adults in the United States, on average. So youth use half as often. But when they drink, they drink not the average two and a half drinks of adults. They drink close to five drinks. They drink twice as much as adults do every time they drink. And so the topography of consumption is different. And it may be that the impact of the higher doses uh, is different. So uh, we know, we heard uh, some of the statistics, that we have nearly 11 million uh, drinkers that are where alcohol is not yet even legal uh, for their age group, that is 12 to 20 in the United States. Uh, 7.2 uh, million of them uh, are bingers, that is, uh, have heavy episodic episodes, uh, drink five or more drinks per occasion, and uh, about two and a half million uh, do that multiple times per month. Well, does it really matter? Uh, one way it might matter is if uh, there are other important things going on during this period of time that uh, where the high dose of consumption or use of multiple substances simultaneously could adversely impact development. And we know from work uh, that uh, comes now uh, uh, 10 to 15 years ago um, by Jay Geed and others at NIH that the structure and functioning of the brain changes with age. And they demonstrated out to the uh, mid-20s where uh, the maturation uh, sequence is such that um, the structures that underlie coordination and affect are the ones that develop first. I kind of think of that as the, the gas if I'm driving a car. And it's the planning, uh, long range evaluation of consequences, the executive functionings that develop more slowly, including inhibition. That's, that's the brakes. And so we, over the course of adolescence, have them putting on the gas before we uh, put up, uh, know how to use the brakes. And there are a variety of different things that unfold that we now know, based on new medical technologies of imaging, that help us understand what are some of the changes that are occurring over the course of adolescence. Some expansion of the cerebral cortex in particular, maturation of subcortical structures, particularly those that have higher densities of uh, sex steroid receptors. There's a reduction in gray matter with age and an increase of white matter volume. And um, most of those projects have, have been demonstrated, just cross-sectional studies of age. And what Ken was referring to is that in our Encanda Center, um, we've now demonstrated that within individuals, each of these is an, is an individual, it shows uh, the changes for those individuals uh, uh, over three points in time. The blue are, are the boys and the red are the girls. And you can see there's a reduction in frontal gray matter, the part of the brain that's sort of the last to develop, and an increase in uh, white matter structures in the brain and actually coherence of that, that white matter structure. So those are the, the pathways, the neural pathways, that link different regions of the brain and result in better and more efficient processing. Additionally, uh, uh, we know that we lose an awful lot of neural connections that, as parents, we work on developing with our children, helping them learn how to structure things, how to, how to organize things for themselves. By some estimates, almost 50% of the neural connections are lost um, early on or uh, over the course of adolescence. And it's related to dendritic pruning and some re regional response changes where we move from global processing to regional processing, and it's important to have those neural tracks to, to make more efficient the connections between these regions. And we do that, uh, or uh, developmentally that happens uh, through myelination, which speeds that, uh, the linkages down the neural axon. 
So those are things that, that we know happen just when we look at uh, age, uh, samples of ages. And, uh, but we can't really know for sure what's going on in the brain, or at least we couldn't uh, previously, without animal studies. And these experimental studies, and particularly studies that then also include post-mortem evaluations, have shown us some very important differences, and I think an important take-home mes message here. And that is that compared to adult consumption, alcohol, and this is true for a number of other substances as well, the adolescent brain is more vulnerable and more impacted by exposure to alcohol. Compared to adults, youth are less sensitive to the sedative effects of alcohol across species. They're more sensitive to the disruption of memory, impairment in neurotransmission, particularly in the hippocampus where new memories form, and more sensitive to social facilitation. Um, we also know that high doses, what we would consider binges, produce long-lasting memory effects, actual damage, tissue damage to the frontal and anterior cortical regions, and slows or retards neuronal repair. Very important. Slows or retards neuronal impair, uh, uh, repair. And then finally, that prolonged exposure um, enhances withdrawal and produces some long-term, what look like, at least in animals, permanent changes. So we don't do postmortems on adolescents, although I've known a few adolescents in which I wouldn't mind uh, doing that. Uh, uh, this work uh, comes uh, from Linda Spear at SUNY uh, Buffalo, George Koob, who's currently the director at NIAAA and was uh, formerly just up the street from me at the Scripps Research Institute, and Fulton Cruz, who has a, a large center that is focused on translational research, trying to create animal models of what were uh, some of the concerns that we have with humans. Um, uh, so although we haven't done that, new technology, uh, we can't do postmortems. new technologies help us look at how alcohol and other drugs might affect teen brains. Uh, this slide shows that uh, for drinkers, those are people who are in the red, compared to controls, non-drinking adolescents, and these folks are in their mid-teens, that we see a, a greater uh, reduction in uh, certain regions of the brain uh, over time uh, for the drinkers than the non-drinkers. That is, more gray matter reduction if you look for each individual. And then um, we also see less acceleration in areas that we would like to see in white matter development. So what we knew cross-sectionally, now we've been able to demonstrate within the individual, exposure to alcohol, heavy exposure to alcohol uh, can uh, alter the way the brain develops. Hence, the importance of the call for focus on research in this area to help us not just understand how it affects development, but to improve the quality of life of citizens in the United States. And I will just mention as an aside, uh, alcohol is involved for adolescents in the top three causes of death. Accidents, number one for adolescents. Remember I said that risk-taking behavior? But suicide and homicide are the, other, are the other two top three causes for death for adolescents. And alcohol is involved in, in um, a, a substantial proportion of these. A long time ago, we looked at, at youth who had long histories of alcohol engagement and uh, drug involvement as well. And we found that even after three or four weeks of abstinence, that while uh, uh, youth who were alcohol, had a history of alcohol dependence, could learn as much in the short run, both in verbal kinds of things, like the types of things that, that teens learn in school in a um, language arts class, in a writing class, in a um, foreign language class, social studies, anything like that. Or uh, in nonverbal uh, information, uh, visual spatial kinds of information, like in math or in physics or in other areas of science, that while they could learn as much at, uh, uh, as non-drinking <laughs> teens, uh, even after three, uh, at three, month, three or four weeks of abstinence, 
when we tested them just 20 minutes later, they were called 10% less. And these are folks who are matched by gender, age, grade, socioeconomic status, family history of alcohol and drug problems drawn from exactly the same communities, had the same grades at the beginning. So what does that mean if they're in the classroom and they're, uh, the teacher is working with them, even if they're clean and sober? That 20 minutes later, if you give them a pop quiz, they're going to do a grade lower, on average. They're not going to get an A, they're going to get a B, or they're not going to get a B, they're going to get a C, or they're going to fail. And so you can see how this can influence youth's perceptions of their own abilities in just a short period of time, even when they're clean and sober. We followed youth over long periods of time, these uh, community youth and youth who had a history of uh, alcohol and drug problems, severe enough to get into treatment. And, and uh, whoop, let me go back here. How did I get there? And uh, just point out that if they stay clean and sober, in the end, they end up looking like uh, non-drinkers or non-problematic youth. Um, if they, they use heavily, even though their, their uh, cognitive scores or memory scores are about the same at the beginning, they quickly deteriorate. And those who have intermittent courses with other drug involvement show a diminished performance over this 10-year period of time. But what I want to highlight here is this solid, heavy black line right here. That line is bad as the, those who are out drug users uh, and below those who are abstainers. These are teens who resolve into drinking. Drinking alone. What's the take-home message? That drinking alone can have long-term neurocognitive impacts. In this case, this is a, a measure of free recall uh, on the CBLT. It's, it's a memory uh, test. Now, that was with folks who had long histories of uh, alcohol and drug problems. We've looked at teens who uh, are in school, are functional, don't meet criteria for alcohol and drug problems, but who, whoop, sorry, uh, but who have uh, multiple binges in the prior month. And what we see with them is that compared to non-users uh, who are again matched and we follow over the same period of time, that it takes about three weeks for them to, to uh, return to their um, uh, learning and memory skills, comparable learning and memory skills, in about the same period of time for visual spatial problem solving. So, Verbal and nonverbal skills are practically impacted. These are kids who are in school. Binging alone is associated with this. Now, if they, if they weren't comparable at these periods of time, we would say, well, you know, they're just not as good. They don't have the same intellectual abilities, cognitive abilities. But we see that that's not the case, that even binging alone can produce these differences. So. Um, with new technologies uh, and by integrating across disciplines, we're now able, uh, uh, in part through the uh, National Brain Initiative, to link basic biological me measurements with behavioral systems and ultimately clinical services. And it was part of this brain initiative that, uh, frankly, led to the development of the National Consortium on Alcohol and Neurodevelopment in Adolescence. And I, I want to uh, highlight this little circled guy here, who I think was talking at the time. Um, Ken is the um, uh, chair for a scientific advisory board, critical to the development of uh, and progression of Encanda, as we refer to it. Uh, While well, we coordinated in, in San Diego, uh, along with my colleague and former student, uh, Susan Tapert, uh, the data analytics core occurs up at Stanford and the um, SRI, and we have sites around the country and advisors uh, around the country for this project. This project was important for several reasons. Uh, it demonstrated for the first time that agencies could work together to fund something important, kind of like you're talking about here uh, going forward in um, Missouri. And the focus really was on adolescent neurodevelopment. You know, looking at it from an individual perspective, uh, we 
have an accelerated longitudinal design that helps us piece together information from youth who are 12 to 21 at the beginning. Goes all the way, uh, we're gonna be following them for 10 years. Um, and we're not just looking at what, what's the impact of alcohol, but what are all the other factors in development that are associated with either greater impact or lesser impact? And how does development influence use? Also, mental health problems, other risk and protective factors, with a real focus on what are the implications for education? What are the implications for prevention? And what are the implications for intervention? We've been able to successfully follow this uh, sample that's a school-based and community sample from around the United States. And we look at a whole variety of different things, um, health and mental health problems, a lot about community characteristics, because we think that relates to availability, access, and influence and development of those expectancies that we heard about before. But we're also looking at important developmental things like um, how, how these youth are doing with the emerging roles of adulthood. Uh, how does alcohol influence sleep? What about trauma and stress? We know there's a lot of comorbidity there. Uh, and importantly, neurocognitive recovery. That's really critical, I think. Uh, we cover a lot of the standard neurocognitive domains. And we're also doing some other things that I think are particularly cool. We're just through getting saliva samples. We're able to look at some genetic and epigenetic uh, data. Uh, we're getting pubertal horm hormones as well to help us uh, understand the use of alcohol in relationship to those neurohormones. And uh, studying in detail with, with smaller groups but at multiple sites, things like sleep, um, uh, what the re neurocognitive recovery processes are like. And through handheld devices, uh, getting actual measurements uh, of teens in their natural environment, their self-reports within like 30 to, to 90 seconds of how much they've been using, who they're with, what they're doing. And we uh, get some um, inobtrusive measures through Fitbit, uh, heart rate, uh, sleep, uh, wake activity and their and regular activities and we're developing some alcohol sensors that are uh, bio nano engineered patches where you can just measure how much alcohol they have in their system we don't even have to ask them that's my that's my long term goal here so uh, that's just a sample of the um, uh, uh, app that we have now remember I said that we've got a reduction in gray matter and uh, an increase in white matter over the course of adolescence. And what we've been able to show now through these kinds of studies is that there are greater gray matter reductions and, uh, um, uh, excuse me, slower gray matter reductions um, and um, uh, uh, less development in uh, white matter if you're a heavy drinker, again on an individual basis showing that there are structural brain changes that result from direct alcohol exposure. So, uh, as I mentioned, not all teens drink like us adults. Uh, and uh, we've also looked at things uh, like extreme drinking. Uh, whether you have a history of alcohol problems or not, these are just youth who are in school. And so despite the fact that youth may look the same when they're 12 or 13 years old, when we follow them over extended periods of time and look at those who are high dose drinkers, meaning 10 or more drinks per occasion, that sounds like a lot to me, but in this study we had about 11% 11, uh, 11 of the youth who reported drinking like that. They performed worse than moderate drinkers on visual, uh, verbal learning and recall measures and um, that it uh, uh, produces, uh, again, significant learning and memory impacts that, are, that have a dose-response relationship. So the more you drink per occasion, not necessarily how many occasions, but the more you drink per occasion, the more it may impact your uh, thinking abilities. Um, also, uh, uh, this group, uh, Susan Tapert and uh, uh, Lindsay Squiglia, have looked use, uh, using some other models um, at what are uh, optimal predictors from ages 12 to 14 up to age 18 of those who are going to be heavy drinkers. Now, there are things that we always know, 
boys drink more than girls in adolescence. We know externalizing behaviors and alcohol expectancies are good predictors of people who uh, move into drinking and may have accelerated courses. But poor neuropsych uh, scores, lower cortical thickness, and lower fMRI activation, particularly on working memory, at ages 12 to 14, also predict the risk for heavy drinking in these youth. So there are different types. By doing these longitudinal studies, there are different types of risks that we may be able to identify to help us help children um, move through adolescence in a healthier fashion. And then CANDA, where we know that uh, there is a lot of comorbidity with heavy alcohol use and trauma. And um, uh, one of our sites, the Duke site in particular, with uh, Michael Tabellis and Kate Nooner, uh, they're interested in the relationship between uh, trauma, the experiences themselves, uh, PTSD uh, symptoms, and family history of alcohol density, as they may relate to these different types of uh, aspects of brain functioning and structure. And I was shocked when I found out that over 60% of the youth in this uh, school-based sample, a normal sample, um, reported traumas, one or more trauma, that would meet that initial criterion for PTSD. You know, you have to have a substantial trauma uh, to then see whether there are any PTSD-specific symptoms. Over 60% of our sample reported something that would be at that level. That's a pretty high level of exposure to trauma. Uh, and I think we normally don't think about our youth as having that much exposure. Now, of course, not all of them go on to, to have PTSD. It's a smaller portion. So understanding what are the risks of progressing, uh, facing that trauma, what are the protective factors that we can do, and how alcohol and drugs may influence the progression to um, uh, PTSD is going to be very important. So how harmful is alcohol to youth? Well, let me say that we know that it influences uh, gray matter and white matter. We know that it influences uh, emotional functioning, particularly fo executive development. And we know that uh, it influences learning and memory. And for boys in particular, more uh, issues related to attention and for girls, more visual spatial functioning. Now, of course, alcohol isn't the only drug that does this. Uh, we heard about opioids. Uh, but the second most common uh, substance consumed now, illicit substance consumed, is cannabis. And I'm not going to go over uh, uh, the specific details of this, but I just want to say that we see many of the same patterns for learning, for memory, reduction in attention, the cognition and, and mood improve with abstinence just as they do with alcohol. And generally, it appears to me that the risks outweigh any possible de benefit um, of uh, cannabis use during normal adolescent development. Now, that's not to say that uh, cannabis uh, or subcomponents of cannabis don't have medicinal purposes. Absolutely, particularly with regard to protracted pain. But we really need to have large-scale studies for us to understand who's going to be most adversely affected by this, how do, how do children, adolescents, and young adults work their way out of this. And that is, in no small part, what uh, the ABCD, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Project, uh, is all about. Uh, as Ken said, I, I co-direct this uh, with Terry Jernigan, uh, noted uh, uh, neuro uh, developmental psychologist uh, at UCSD, and we have the good fortune of having Anders Dale lead the data side of this. I want to say, uh, not in a braggadocio way, but I think from the NIH's perspective, this is a transformative study. It's the Framingham study for youth, because it's really focused on development for youth, not just alcohol and drugs but really understanding what is normal brain development. We don't have norms for it. We'll be able to develop those with ABCD. 
we don't know in what ways do communities impact and environmental toxins impact uh, and media exposure impact development and brain development, that's part of it. But ABCD is going to be a resource for the scientific community to answer some of these questions. And we are studying 11,874 youth and their families. Uh, we acquired that many from 21 uh, different sites across the country in just a two-year period. Each child has a six to seven hour assessment battery, of which uh, Ken has been uh, very instrumental in helping to design. Uh, and the parents have a three or four hour battery as well. Uh, they uh, complete neuroimaging. And uh, many of the things that uh, we're investigating um, will, I think, help us help youth in the future. We'll have the, create the opportunity to improve the quality of clinical care and public health in the United States. We're interested in brain development trajectories, academic achievement, social and emotional functioning, and physical well-being of American youth. Um, this uh, uh, sample is drawn in a way that matches at the 97.5% level the census characteristics of youth in the United States. And with these 21 sites, we had close to access to close to 30% of youth in that age range in the, in the United States. But it only comes from uh, universities and strong scientific leaders uh, like those in your midst, midst here today working together to produce something like this. Now, uh, this just lists the objectives that, I, that I, uh, I mentioned. And the important thing to understand about this study is that it takes experts in epidemiology. It takes experts in genetics. It takes experts in neuroscience. And there is no single person or even single department that typically has all this kind of expertise. This is really population neuroscience. Large scale samples so we can look at how individuals and subgroups develop and grow over time. And we aren't looking at genetic versus environmental risk. We really think of this as how uh, it's not an or situation, it's how do these things work together to uh, help us understand how known risks influence development and to identify new types of risks that maybe we have never thought about before. We want to, uh, over the course of the 10 years of the study, um, be able to incorporate new types of understandings of development uh, in particular, new technologies and uh, new findings from neuroscience to help us uh, best articulate what's going on with adolescents and understand how they move to adulthood. And the, uh, the final thing I want to say about the, the study is that this is, it's a pretty uh, progressive approach. It's a different way of thinking about science. science. Um, uh, because the data that we are collecting at all of the 21 sites is not held just for those 21 sites. We are bringing this data set forward for global use and in a very rapid fashion. It's not after five years of study. Every year we're releasing all the new data that we have after it's been quality controlled, quality checked. But the idea here is that um, this will, this information will be available to everyone, all the graduate students, all the postdocs, all the faculty here uh, in, in uh, this room will have as much access as, as I will have to these data and in a, in a short period of time. Very different way of thinking about things. Um, I think I've already said that. So what is it that we're, we're doing? We're looking at uh, all these different uh, kinds of things, neurocognition, what their culture and environment is like. We're taking biospecimens. It's not always easy to get nine and 10-year-olds to spit into a little tube, I'll tell you. You really have to coax them. Uh, we do structural and functional MRI uh, uh, with these folks. We do uh, health and mental health assessments, substance use assessments, for example, and we're uh, 
launching Fitbits with nine and 10 year, 10 year olds. I think it's very cool. So we'll, we'll, we'll see, hopefully they don't wreck too many of, of these things. But we're also gathering information passively, like school records, and we're geocoding their residential history. So we can have, have a sense of how um, environmental toxins that they might be exposed to, or the density of certain kinds of problems in their environment. And ultimately, we'll have teachers fill out, fill out forms as well. So from a variety of different uh, realms, we're trying to get a real picture in, in each of these areas. I think about it like a different instrument in a, uh, as a child is beginning to play. You want to have enough detail about how that instrument is played to then ultimately be able to put it together as uh, understanding the symphony of um, um, development. And rather than talk more about it now, I want to just show you a little video. This is an advantage of uh, having large-scale projects that can benefit each and every site around the nation that uh, are, are involved. And so if I do this correctly, which we're not trusting me to do this, you notice. As parents, we all worry about our kids' well-being, but what about their brains? The federal government has launched the biggest study ever of teenagers' brains, looking at how everything from homework to screen time to even how we parent impacts their cognitive health. They're regular kids taking part in something extraordinary. Nine-year-old Nick and 10-year-old Gemma are being followed by researchers for the next decade, part of a revolutionary new study to find out what helps and hurts the teenage brain. What kind of brain do you think you have? A very big one. <laughs> My brain is really cool and it's like the most important part of our body. It's called ABCD, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. Launched by NIH, it will track over 11,000 kids through adolescence, studying how dozens of factors impact their brains. Drugs and alcohol, diet and exercise, screen time, academic and social stress, sleep patterns, sibling relationships, even how they're parented. Susan Bookheimer is one of the study's lead investigators. We can look at boys versus girls. Um, we can look at different um, socioeconomic status. We can look at different exposures. We can look at kids who are in high-stress schools versus low-stress schools. In the 10-year study conducted at medical centers across the country, kids get regular physical exams, cognitive tests, and MRI scans. They and their parents also fill out detailed, confidential questionnaires about their habits and lifestyles. When we see brain changes, we need to know what is the cause of them, when do they start. Can you see when a kid comes in at, who's nine, do you already see brain changes? Can you already see anxiety? Can you already see depression? Today we can't tell, and that's really the purpose of this study. So you gotta do like one more. Nick's mom worries about how stress in school is affecting his brain. Outside home, there's a lot of things that can influence them. Um, and their brain and how they're thinking. It could be their teachers, it could be their friends, it could be anybody. When you're dealing with your friends or you're watching a movie or listening to music, are you aware of your brain responding in those situations? Oh yeah, like when I'm on my tablet, I'm, if I'm on it too long, I'm like, is this gonna do something to my brain or is this bad for it? To me, it's a little frightening that we have all of these children today who are spending 10 hours a day in front of a screen for their socialization and we don't know what's going to happen to their brains or how that's going to affect their relationships when they get older. The study also looks at the brain effects of extracurriculars. Gemma's dad encourages her to do activities like singing and dancing. I'd like some backup to know that they really do contribute to, to good brain development. You would like to be able to say, look, at, it's not just me, your dad, telling you to do this. Science shows us that this, in fact, will make you happier, more resilient, stronger. Exactly. For participating, kids and parents are both paid several hundred dollars per visit. The study's first results are due out in the next year. Do you think this study will change the way we educate our kids, the way we parent, the way society looks at the teenager? I think so. We hope that at the end we'll be able to say children who do these kinds of activities actually end up doing a lot better than children who don't.
In an online poll, we asked viewers to tell us what you are worried most about impacting your kid's brain. And the number one answer across the board, screen time. Screen wow. time, screen time, yeah. A big difference even just when my kids were little, we said, you know, no phone, no screen time until yeah. middle school, and now kids are on screens at two, three. Yeah. But is it possible in 10 years when they look back at that study, they'll say, hey, that much screen time didn't really do any harm? They could say that. I don't know. <laughs> 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 okay. So you can see how by measuring all of these different things, we may be able to put that information in a way to understand the symphony of adolescent development. Um, I uh, want to uh, close by saying we have these data available to you, uh, both from NCANDA and from ABCD uh, on our websites. Uh, how you get that, uh, get to that data, it's pretty easy, it's pretty direct, and again, it's available uh, uh, internationally, and as we release the data, uh, all of those data will b become available to everyone. So there are a lot of good master's theses, there are a lot of good dissertations in here, uh, and we want you to take uh, advantage of it. And, uh, so I want to thank you today for uh, beginning this uh, impressive symposium with uh, just a little review of some of the work that we've been doing and what I hope you see as an exciting opportunity in the future. Thank you. I think we have time for just a few questions. I know I, I went a little longer than anticipated, but Ken's introduction was a little longer than, than I expected. But any, any questions? Yeah, those of you who know Ken uh, know that that's, that's not unusual. So most of your research has been on alcohol, um, and um, ironically enough, today, um, de December the 6th, um, in Missouri, uh, uh, cannabis has now been legalized for uh, medical use. And I'm wondering what differences um, you, if any, you expect to see in the research um, that needs to be done uh, in, in that area. From, in the cannabis area? Yeah. you know. Distinctions between what you expect to find in um, with cannabis use and alcohol use. So it, it is interesting. I, I, I want to highlight one thing with regard to cannabis, and that is that uh, uh, the cannabis that used to be available in the United States uh, several decades ago uh, was of a potency that that is anywhere from three to ten times less than what's available today. So all the studies that we've done in the past on the impact of uh, cannabis on functioning, on development, really, we, we can't apply that today because that's the, not the type, that's not the intensity of exposure that youth are uh, experienced today. So I just want to want to highlight that, and that's, that's an important thing for us to understand that we can't take those old uh, scientific findings and apply them directly today. I will, just as an aside, say it's very difficult to do cannabis research. It's, it's a long and grueling process. Cannabis is only available at certain sites uh, around the country for federally funded projects. It's extremely difficult, and I know uh, uh, Dennis McCarthy is one of the people who is uh, pursuing this and will be very helpful information in the future. What we do know just based on the information that we have so far, is that we see some of the same types of detrimental impacts on neurocognition, on thinking abilities from cannabis that we see with alcohol. And again, it depends on exposure, intensity, duration, et cetera. There are a, a, number, of different, uh, a number of differences. What we don't know yet are is it sort of the same whether you use alcohol or cannabis? Uh, are these additive effects? Are they more severe? Are there synergistic effects? And we're hoping that we'll be able to get some of this information uh, in ABCD and in Encanda. The, I'll, I'll mention that the um, nanobioengineered patches that we're, we're in the process of developing can measure alcohol, can measure cannabis, can measure glucose, the kind of things that are sort of the modern uses of, of the, those things. So we don't know yet, really, what cannabis use today, is, how it's going to impact development. But there's nothing that would suggest to us 
that the, uh, the potency of the cannabis that's being used today um, would have uh, deleterious effects any less than what alcohol use has. And in California, we, we uh, um, uh, have legalized mar marijuana use as well. Makes no sense. I'll just, just mention as an aside in New Zealand in a long-term 10-year uh, study that they did with adults, they found a 10-point IQ reduction for people who were regular uh, cannabis users, very regular cannabis users, you know, over a 10-year period. I don't know about you, but as I age, I'm going to lose enough IQ points. <laughs> I don't need a, a booster in that direction. I, I think that uh, shares my opinion. Well, again, thank you. Oh, we have one more question. Yes. Hi. It's kind of maybe more of a comment. My name's Heather Harlan, and I work as a counselor and prevention specialist here in Columbia. And I think it's just information I want this group to know. 95% of addictions begin before the age of 21. Right now, to my knowledge, Missouri raises absolute zero towards primary prevention. I think we would be outraged if we treated cancer that way. We have money coming in from the federal government, from our county government, and from our city. But Missouri raises, to my knowledge, and this, there's somebody that knows something, but that I've explored absolute zero. And yet, we know more about primary prevention research base than we do treatment. So my encouragement is for us to begin talking to our funders to be able to explore that. And there are probably many people in this room, if you said, how would you prevent an addiction, would not have an answer to that question. They could tell you about heart disease or cancer. And if we had 95% of cancers beginning before the age of 21, I bet we would be funneling some funding that way. Thank you. Excellent, Excellent point. Uh, I do want to just... Uh, uh, we always throw out this, this ratio of uh, seven-fold return on investment for prevention in the uh, addiction arena relative uh, to the cost to society uh, over time. So um, I would encourage that activity. Thank you. Okay, and again, thank you all. I appreciate it.